Aloha and welcome back to the Embodied Healing Self Podcast. I'm so excited to share with you today a beautiful and radiant, authentic mm-hmm. being, Miss Hannah McKenna. She is known as the Sacred Rebel, and today we are going to do some myth busting around spiritual growth and spiritual communities. We're going to talk about sisterhood. We're going to talk about radical authenticity and all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm super happy to be having this conversation with you today and welcoming you to the podcast. Hannah, how are you? Thank you, Jen. I'm so good. I always love talking to you, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you here. You're doing so many amazing things in the world. In just the last year, you created a signature program to share with women. You've hosted several retreats. You've got your own women's sisterhood program that you're running, and you're just doing amazing things. So I love to, of course, illuminate the beautiful women that are serving in that way in the world. So I want to invite you to share a little bit about yourself and how, how, what is Sacred Rebel? How did Sacred Sacred Rebel become a thing? And like, what does she mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. So I am a life coach. I'm also a retreat facilitator. um, And The sacred rebel language came to me maybe about a year or so ago, but I think for those of us that are sacred rebels, it's just like putting the language to the thing that I've always felt and creating the space for that to be right for me. Um, And so what sacred rebel means to me uh, as someone that's been a spiritual seeker for a long time, you know, I'm in my mid thirties now, but I was like the youngest person at retreats, you know, back when I was, you know, like 19 or something and all of the older, like amazing wise elders there would, you know, take me under their ring. Um, so I've been on this journey for a long time. So like the, the sacred part of that, I resonated with for a long time, the sacred part of sacred rebel. Like I always knew there was like more than just, you know, going to school and getting a job and doing all of that. I always knew there was something bigger that I was a part of or that we're all a part of so the sacredness of life was always really accessible to me the rebel part (laughs) embracing the rebel part came a little bit later so uh by nature I'm a questioner I do like rules that are good for everyone um but the other end of that range for me is but why you know, like that question has always been accessible for me you know I was the girl in Sunday school raising my hand and getting you know told to be quiet with all sorts of questions. Um, So the rebel part, when you bring rebellion into sacredness, um, I feel like I am a rebel within sacred communities because I question a lot. Um, And I'm also a rebel in regular life because I have that sacredness. You know, I'm not Mm -hmm. like the nine to fiver, um, you know, just never talking about like spiritual questions or anything like that. So the rebellion is kind of in refusing to fit entirely in one camp of like the regular folks and the spiritual folks. So those of us that are kind of in between, we're the sacred rebels. We're the ones that are saying like, yeah, I can be fully authentic and belong in both of these, but also just fully belong to myself. I love that so much. I'm like giggling because it's like, (laughs) finally, somebody put words to something that a lot of people are feeling. And gosh, there's so much to unpack there. First of all, I want to acknowledge that yes, you do have a wisdom about you. I knew that the first time that our paths crossed, gosh, Mm. almost a year and a half ago. And and I love that. And I see that in you. I know most of my friends are in their 60s. (laughs) Like the white buffalo women tribe I'm a part of, like, you know, they're all 20, 25 years older than me. And I'm going on a retreat this weekend with spending some time with elders. It's like my happy place. Um, And just before we got on the show, we were talking about Hey, you were talking about how you can't wait to have gray hair. And I'm like, (laughs) and I'm like, well, I do, I do call them wisdom stripes though. I do tell my daughter when she's, you know, she's like, you know, do you, do you want to color your hair? I'm like, no, they're wisdom stripes. I earned them. Yes. But yeah, there's so much to, to be said around that. And I, you know, I love that you, you give a voice to the people who can witness what's happening in spiritual communities and also in the world and just say, yeah, that's not in alignment with me. And that's not in alignment with me either. And by the way, for all the listeners, for those of you who are familiar, 
um, with the Enneagram, Santa is a very healthy Enneagram eight. So <laughs> if anybody listening is an eight, this is, you know, this is ways that we can show up in a healthy way is to create space for people who like to question things. So when you think about what you said, what you were feeling here versus the spaces that you were showing up in, what was it that you were feeling here that gave you the language to create sacred rebel? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So what was coming up for me was this intense desire for belonging, which all of us have, right? We wouldn't actually be functioning as an animal group if we didn't want to belong um, within our tribes, um, within our groups. So I had that coming up and really liked a lot of what was being said in spiritual communities. You know, like I've gone down like the yoga train and been really into yoga, for example. Um, but I'm also not, and this is a giant generalization, some yoga communities that I've gone to, you know, they have like even like terms like diets that they follow or things like that. Or I would be talking with someone and, and that some people in spiritual communities get these blinders on, which we'll talk about later, um, but why those, I think those come up, but um, like rules for how you need to dress or talk or how you spend your free time or the things that you eat um, in order to fully belong in that group. And I didn't really belong. And so what started happening was when I was younger, I was internalizing that of, well, I need to actually do these things then to fully belong in this community. But it didn't feel good. I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel fully aligned with who I am. And it felt a little bit like a fraud. Like, oh, I, I'm actually not really the yoga girl, you know, or, oh, I'm, I'm actually not really the, the meditator that everyone else is doing, um, the way that everyone else is doing this. Um, and so it came from a place of frustration at first, frustration with myself, because we often end up like turning it inward of what am I doing wrong? And then later on realized like, well, F that, like <laughs> something wrong with me. I'm trying to fit in a box that I don't fit into. So um Embracing the idea of the sacred rebel really came out of necessity or uh, when I started to practice radical authenticity, uh, which I think is the foundation of having unshakable self-love is really being authentic with who you are. When I really started looking at that and appreciating all of the ways that I show up in different like communities and don't totally fit into each one, um, rather than making that wrong, I thought, what if that's exactly how I'm meant to be? And what if I'm not the only one that feels this way? What if I'm not the only person in this room that doesn't also drink celery juice? You know, like what if I'm the person that likes lifting heavy weights also, not just yoga, you know, like all of that. Like what if I'm the only, not the only one that's wondering, like, do I have to do all of the things of this group in order to feel belonging? Oh, I love all of that. And I can certainly relate to all of that. You're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm just reflecting back on, I, I was a yoga teacher for, for many, many years. And, you know, there's so many, I guess, and, it, and we're not just talking about yoga teaching, but it's just an easy place to start that I think we get this concept mm -hmm. of like what that community is about, because it's kind of, it's a gateway into spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was a, a health coach for eight years and people just assumed all the time I was vegan. Like, you must be vegan. You must be this. You must not, you know, be Christian. Like they made all these assumptions about me. I was like, whoa, yeah. whoa, no, I'm just doing my thing that works for me. So I love that you put language to this because I, what I notice happens is that it, it can also prevent people from actually having the experience the full experience that they're seeking because because it the energy unless we give ourselves permission to to be different in that space it's hard to open up to even receive the full experience of that um that was just kind of what was coming through to me on that i want to ask you because you mentioned blinders and as coaches, that's like one of kind of our superpowers. Like we help people to, to see what they cannot see. And there's usually reasons that it's hard for them to see that. But that's one of the things that, that we really do is we help facilitate change or whatever it is that they want by also holding them lovingly accountable to the things that they either can't see or they're not willing to see. So when we're talking about radical 
authenticity, what are the blinders that are coming up around that for people? Oh boy, where do you even start, right? <laughs> because we all have our own blinders. We all have our own ways of um, not being able to see. So how about um, top three in spiritual communities? Top three blinders. I think the first thing that's coming through is performative spirituality rather than it being from an authentic place. So that can look like, uh, you know, being in some sort of group, like, um, you know, like the sisterhood program that I have, or, you know, circles that, you know, both of us have been a part of, or like men's work circles or all of that, all of those types type of things. Um, sometimes signaling, signaling that we're doing the work checks enough boxes of why we're there to not need to actually get down into it. So if you're wanting to belong, if you're wanting to appear um, that you are, you know, taking care of yourself, um, or I don't even want to say, because I don't think it's, it's from a place of um, vanity. I think it's usually from a place of confusion of, I don't mm -hmm. actually know how to feel this way, truly. I don't know how to actually integrate these things. So what I'm going to do instead is signal to my community that I'm doing them. So that could be like doing some sort of, um, it could be like dressing some sort of way, like you said, like in you know, the yoga community, for example, there are ways to dress in the yoga community that don't make you stick out, right? Like you don't show up to, in jeans to a, you know, <laughs> so like a hot yoga class or something. Um, but so there are ways that we can superficially or externally signal that we are um, belonging to a community or doing internal work by posting on our Instagrams or something like that, or, um, you know, talking about things without actually like really prioritizing it, this, this solitary work. It, when I hear you say that, it's like basically comes down to being versus saying the embodiment mm. and the integrity of I am versus I do. It's like, such a different energy. There's nothing to even prove. You don't even have to say it. There's no external validation needed. If you are the thing, which is what embodied healing self is all about. It's about the embodiment of mm -hmm. truth, knowing that we have everything we need for everything that we're becoming already. It's And when we're in integrity with that, because we are that thing, we become that thing. And by the way, it's exhausting to be doing all the things like making an externally validating conscious effort to eat a certain way or to be a certain way that isn't in alignment with our authenticity is exhausting. So for the listeners, if you're feeling overwhelmed, exhausted, oh, busy is another one of my favorite ones. I'm busy. Like that just means misaligned. If you're noticing those feelings, this is a question you might want to ask yourself. Like, am I really truly showing up in my radical authenticity. What, like, what did you ask yourself in that moment where you're like, this is, this isn't, I'm not really in alignment with who I really am. Like, what was the question you asked yourself? What was, what was kind of the shift? What was that moment that you shifted and decided, look, I can still be sacred. I value sacred space. And this is where my heart is. And I can still be a person who stands in my clarity to say that I am still sacred in my own space without living up to everybody else's expectations. Mm. Yeah, I think part of it is, like I said, I'm naturally like I'm the Enneagram 8. I'm used to questioning. That's just my nature. And so I had started, as many of us do, um, in my teenage years and early 20s and all of that, questioning how I'm not fitting, how I'm wrong, how what I need to do to change. And within spiritual community, like the circles that I've been a part of, or, um, you know, like even within religion that I grew up in, um, I started thinking about, like, why am I assuming I'm the issue here? <laughs> Why am I always the issue? Let's, and... let's just pause there for a moment because I think a lot of people need to hear this. If you find yourself asking yourself, like, what's wrong with me or why am I the issue? Mm. It's like, take that moment to pause. So keep going. I, I just really yes. want, I feel like that's a really like nugget of wisdom right there. So when you were mm. finding yourself saying, why am I the issue? 
that and it takes a lot of courage because if you are in that spot where you're wondering why you don't fit in to leave the rules that the community is giving you these are this is how you fit in when you decide to leave that it can feel really scary of well then how am i going to fit in if, if i'm not broken then now what <laughs> right and that can feel really scary and so oh yeah and we're not broken no nobody's we're broken. not nobody's but, broken but then if you oh gosh this is so good especially for women because we do this like how often have women joined together and they find almost almost like they find something to complain about just to fit in and yes. why why <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's, that's a that's, deep, deep root down yeah. to why. And, and I'd love to talk about that. And first I'd love to just kind of like close this loop of, of what I was sharing in terms of like embracing your authenticity, because um, something that I started realizing was in the spiritual communities in some of them, the um, it seemed to me that they were trying to rid their humanness and be in the, in the spiritual realm to live in the spiritual realm. And I started thinking, then why did I come down here? If the point of succeeding, quote unquote, succeeding as a human is to become spirit, then why did we as spirit become human? I think the point of being here is to be human, <laughs> to experience like who I am, like who Hannah McKenna, or, like who I am all the way down. Um, and how, if I am a spiritual being, which I am, then everything I do is a spiritual practice, right? If I am a sacred being, then the desires of my heart are sacred. The things that I enjoy, the things that I want to create or co-create, that's connected to my spirit. I don't need to seek that out um, mm -hmm. by getting rid of the parts of me that are the Hannah parts of me. Okay, that was so good. Like, I think you could write a book on that. And <laughs> I love that so much because one of the blinders in the spiritual community is this idea that we're here to ascend. And mm -hmm. five years ago, when I was deep into my spiritual practice, I found myself checking out of my body and it was like, awesome. It was like, oh, I'm just in this like la la mm -hmm. land and like, you know, avoiding the challenges that I felt were being brought by my humanness. Mm -hmm. And I realized I heard a voice very clear audience, your purpose is to embody the spirit within you. And mm. it's almost like, you know, many people feel disconnected. And if, if, well, of course we would feel disconnected if we're trying to avoid the human experience. And so I believe, and that's what I teach, that's the embodied healing self. The healing mm. self is the human part. The embodiment is the human experience. Of course, we're all spiritual beings. Like, I mean, for those of us that everybody listening to this show probably <laughs> believes that, yeah. but you're right. Like I've had an out-of-body experience. So I know that if I didn't want to be here, I don't have to be, I could just check out and just, you mm -hmm. know, project, project out of the physical body. So I love that you, and I didn't even know we were going to talk about this, but I love that you shared that because that is another blind spot in the spiritual community is this idea that, uh, of course, there are challenges. Of course, there are dense energies. Of course, uh, like that is what we agree to do in the human experience because that makes us appreciate being human. If everything was just rainbows and unicorns, that would be awesome, but then we wouldn't appreciate what mm -hmm. we had to go through to get there. On the other hand, because we're doing sacred rebel stuff here, let's look at the other point of view. Yeah. Another one of the blinders in the spiritual community is almost an addiction to healing and never really being present with where we are. And so that is why I don't, you know, healing self means that we're just always in the process of it. It doesn't mean that we're ever healed or that we're ever broken. It means that it's an ongoing journey. And I shared with you, I was in a, a spiritual community for a few years where it was always like, and then, and then the next thing it's like, okay. And then the mm. next layer, the difference is 
that some people can become very attached to the idea that they have to heal something to then become a spiritual being, which you, you don't have to. All you have, mm. all we really have to do is just acknowledge that we already are that. There isn't anything that we have to do, which is the radical authenticity. It's like, it's actually, hey guys, everyone listening, it's actually a lot easier than we're making it. Now, yeah. another blinder is avoidance. Okay, so spiritual bypassing and avoidance, we're not giving you permission to avoid the things that are meeting you at the door and saying, look, you need to look at this thing because it's not working for you. So when I say those things, like, how do you navigate that balance? Because it's really easy to ascend and avoid. It's easy to get trapped into the addiction of healing. And none of it is even, neither of those are truth. So how do you navigate you know, your, I guess your center, your, your center being mm -hmm. around, you know, in that community, when you notice those opportunities for growth are inviting you in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that you were saying kind of like pulled something together for me internally as you, as you were talking. So um, you said there's like the avoidant part of healing where uh, like one shadow of what we're talking about could be to just not want to heal right and i love the attachment style of theories so <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that it probably lines up too right like what's your attachment style are you an avoidant uh attachment style so then interesting is that coming up with how you heal are you wanting to turn away and just uh oh, no i just that's not a big problem i'll deal with that later um or the anxious attachment style which i think is something that i was maybe more dealing with in my self-healing journey. Uh, once I started in this um, spiritual community where there was a space for me to be held in a place that I felt safe to heal some things, uh, I really liked that breakthrough moment. The breakthrough moment of, oh my gosh, I finally cleared this pattern. I finally see it more clearly now. Um, and I got to know myself more deeply in those moments. I got like this like high off of it. And I wanted to keep having that. And eventually I got to a point, not that I am like ascended or by any means, but I got to a point where I realized I don't actually need that pattern. I don't need to always be healing something in order to number one, belong in this community, which was in that community itself. There was a lot of intentional space held. Um, and something that you and I were talking a little bit before we, we started this call, um, I think that we are relational beings, right? And so one of my teachers, Christian Pankhurst, talks about this, and he he talks about how um, all of our pains are related to another human being. Like if we just grew up in a vacuum, never having another any human contact, like would we actually experience pain? Can we hurt ourselves without ever having known um, another person? Um, and he, you know. His, his thought is that no, and, and I, I tend to agree with that because all of the pains we have are in relation to someone else or in relation to someone else, how someone else thinks of us or how we think they think of us or all this stuff. Um, and so I think our healing also needs to be in community in some way. We can do so much work and our, your self work is really important, um, but deep healing happens in community. That's why I started my sisterhood program. That's why I love being a coach. Um, but uh because of that i don't actually think we really need to go in in like to seek out healing opportunities i think if you have your eyes open and your heart open and you are around other human beings <laughs> there will be opportunities that arise for you to look at patterns that are no longer serving you look at the way that you're feeling triggered or activated by what's happening um and i don't think we need to have like this okay tuesdays at 11 a.m i'm gonna you know heal something purposeful i think just in being like being married for example or you know having a family or having co-workers or a boss we're constantly going to be invited into opportunities to look at how we're showing up and how we want to show up yes i love that and i just want to do a little a ho to what you said on you know the there's just something that really goes beyond words. You're really good with words. Maybe you'll have you'll have a way of putting this with words. But the level of 
connection and like I want to say intimacy is an mm-hmm. into me I see that we get from the reflections of other people when we're in community is just so far exceeds and transcends. Mm-hmm. It's it's why every single person in my private coaching is a part of my group coaching program because I've seen and witnessed women over the years that I would do the one-on-one and then some of them would choose to do it at the same time, but then some of them would do it a year later and they would say to me like it was there was such a deeper level of transformation in community because the courage to stand in your truth, to stand in radical authenticity, to be seen and witnessed in that and to be supported in Mm -hmm. it and to be loved unconditionally either way is something that not all of us ever even had as children. And to be given that permission and to know that we're not alone. Like the thing is, is, is that we all have very similar emotions and feelings about experiences, but the external experiences are very, are very different. And it's kind of our tribal, you know, mentality that, that brings us together. And that's why I love the sisterhood work that you do, because offering that space for us to just come together, it's, it's not even like healing. It's more of witnessing. It's like just witnessing Mm -hmm. somebody in something that was painful for them and acknowledging like, yes, this is part of the human experience or somebody in their joy and their celebration witnessing that it's just so powerful. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, one of the things that, that you shared before this show is that the community of sisterhood is that you've created the space that you've created is a space of really, I think you use the word like repackaging patriarchal ideologies. What does that mean to you? Yeah, so the sisterhood I've created, rather than being the repackagement of patriarchy, of course, we don't want that, but we're healing the ways that um, different spiritual concepts, I think my hot take, again, Enneagram 8, Aries here, I'm like full of hot takes. Um, a lot of my like, hot takes are around the, the concept that some of our spiritual practices that are around are actually just repackaged patriarchal ideas. Um, and in the sisterhood that I'm in, uh, that's something that we are consciously, intentionally looking at and uh, together co-creating a space of, is this how we want to show up in the world? Um, you know, my sisterhood is, a, you know, just one group of women together. Um, but I think that when we come together and look at something, it does shift. You know, the name of the, my program is The Sisterhood. And of course, we are not the entire sisterhood, but in some way, I think we are. You know, if, if we come together and say, you know, this is how I show up for you. This is how you show up for me. This is how I'm um, showing up for myself. I think it has a ripple effect, energe- ripple effect energetically. And so a repackaged patriarchal idea, what do I mean by that? For example, um, my hot take, I think a lot of manifestation talk in the world is a repackaged oppression of women especially especially women I think everyone but um for example like a lot of the manifestation talk out there is essentially mindset focused um you know like the power of positive thinking or things like that or Mm -hmm. you need to be uh if you want to manifest you know your dream career then you need to be thinking of your dream career while thinking that you can do it and being in a positive uh emotional space as you think about those things so how does this relate to the patriarchy? <laughs> no, we, we've, but, uh, I love this because we've had this conversation before about, you know, hesitating to even use the word manifesting because there's such a, mm-hmm. there's an unhealthy shadow to, to using the word manifesting. And I think mm-hmm. that the deeper shadow comes again, when we attach ourselves to an idea that's outside of us, that's yes. where the disconnect is. So yeah, keep talking. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I think you're totally on it. And so we're like lining up here, both of our concepts. So um, the patriarchy hurts all people, right? Not just women, uh, but women specifically, historically under the patriarchy um, need to control how they think in order to fit into whatever subservient um, you know, <laughs> roles that men had wanted us to be in. Um, and what makes me really upset about manifestation in particular, so many women gravitate towards this concept um, because I think it's, 
because of the patriarchy, men aren't as encouraged to look at their emotions and look at themselves. So that's part of the reason why women are here more um, and part of the reason why the patriarchy hurts men. Um, but uh, so many women are, the, are in the manifestation space and they're, they're there because they wanna make their lives better. They wanna show up more fully. They wanna live more boldly and vibrantly. And then they walk in and in order to manifest, you can't think any bad thoughts. You can't say anything that's negative. You can't, you need to, you'll keep your mouth shut, pretend you aren't thinking that, think of something else. You know, and I, and I started looking at that and I'm like, how is this any different from what we just came from people? How is this better? And so the work of uh, Lacey Phillips in particular around her ideas of manifestation totally rocked my world because I believe manifestation, it's not positive thinking. It's believing fully that I am worthy of having the thing that I want. And so when I have this dream career, for example, that I want to have, um, and all of a sudden I start having this thought creep in of, well, you aren't qualified enough, you know, and, and you can't even, you aren't even smart enough to do that. You aren't smart enough to have this thing. The quote unquote manifestation of positive thinking would say, you need to get rid of that thought and start writing affirmations of I am smart, I'm smart, I'm smart, right? What I think impacts way more, um, like way more truly, is thinking and asking myself, what part of me thinks that I'm not smart? Where is that story coming from? So rather than the negative thoughts being something we need to just get out, I think the negative thoughts are the signposts toward where we need healing, where we need love, like what part of us is worried that we aren't deserving of that or not worthy of that. So um, that's my hot take on manifestation oh, that 100 positive thoughts sister. aren't the, yeah, it's the it's negative almost, thoughts. It's a huge it. blinder. It's, a, it's, it's almost, again, it's like a disconnect. Like we talked about earlier, it's like, it's kind of that ascension, not the, the willingness not to, I mean, that part of you is the gateway to the expansion. That's why it's called a stretch. Mm. That's why it's called growth. It's a, it's, and by the way, for everybody who's listening, it's uncomfortable either way. So you choose, are you, are you going <laughs> to, are you going to be uncomfortable and just stay where you are avoiding it and letting it happen again? Or are you going to be uncomfortable leaning into the stretch? You choose, mm. you choose your energetic blueprint. You choose your, you know, soul wisdom guiding you. Uh, and that's why community is so helpful because when you're in it with sisters and you're like doing it together, it's like you're celebrating and dancing and crying together. And, mm. and then, and then when you're done, you're done. It's like, okay, yeah. we're, <laughs> we're Yes. And something I love together. about this. Yeah. Something I really love about being in the sisterhood, um, in general, and then also, you know, like my program, for example, is yes, healing and community is so powerful. And also it still gets to be on your time. You know, like let's bring the rebel back into this. It is sacred for you to need time. It's sacred for you not to be ready to show your vulnerability right away. And um, within group, for example, you know, we could have an activity where people are vulnerably sharing. Uh, but one thing that's really important to me in that space is getting self-consent, you know, is this the right time for me to share this vulnerability? Um, am I ready to share this vulnerability? Maybe yes. Is it right now the right time for me to share that? Maybe no, you know? And so really getting in touch with um, how we need to feel the container is set before we allow ourselves to, to be seen in sisterhood. And so sometimes that healing happens when I, you know, share maybe this vulnerable shame story that I have that I'm ready to let go of and, and being seen and witnessed and loved by sisters um, can be really healing. Uh, but if I did that before I was ready, I could have like a vulnerability hangover the next day and it actually didn't feel good in my system. It might've been re-traumatizing for that story, right? Or, or the reason that I had that story. So in community, what's really cool is that maybe I'm not ready to share, but I get to see someone else share. And it's like, we're all mirrors for each other. Like you said, you know, and I get like this little magic carpet ride of seeing, oh man, Jen shared that. And that's similar to what I'm feeling. And she's still worthy. And I can see that she's still worthy. And maybe next week, that's something that I explore, you know, but um, ultimate grace, ultimate you know, uh, patience for ourselves during this process is so, so key. A hundred percent. And sometimes maybe we even get what we need just from witnessing somebody else. Mm. Maybe we, it, you know, it gives us permission to just really tap into that that's what we needed. I know 
when I co-facilitated some retreats for the healing of men, where it was purely in form of witnessing and supporting and holding space, I was blown away at what was being healed through me just by witnessing. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't, I didn't need to say or do anything, but what I witnessed was exactly what I needed to heal the parts of me that were struggling with the masculine. And so I love that you said that because that's, that's like the grace and the beauty of community is um, giving permission to just be in radical authenticity. Do I share? Do I not share? I like to share the questions all the time around anything is like, is this in alignment with me? Does it have to be me? Is it the right time? And just those are three questions I ask myself before I commit to anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good example of in circle. Like, and I think that, you know, maybe we would feel pressured, like we have to share something because everybody else did. And if, if I don't have this horrible victim story, or if I don't have this big breakthrough, then I'm nobody. And why am I here? And I'm just not good enough, which again, activates, you know, the underneath belief that we have that we're not worthy or good enough. Mm -hmm. And so it's always the invitation to just lean in and, and just be present with what it is that we're experiencing. That's what all of this about is about. It's, there is no right or wrong way. There is no answer. That's what you're mm -hmm. saying is sacred rebel, but it's more about just being in the present moment and aligning to the radical authentic truth in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even as you're saying, you know, oh, because I've been in situations like that, right? Where like everyone is shared and I, I don't I don't feel ready to, but I feel like I need to in order to belong here. Isn't that interesting? That story itself, I feel like I need to share even though I'm not ready, right? Like everything is always an invitation to knowing yourself more deeply and identifying stories that maybe you've had your whole life or maybe someone handed you, right? <laughs> you know, your parents or other authority figures or something like that. So it's all perfect. It's all perfectly orchestrated. Um, whether you share or you just notice that you don't want to, or you notice that you don't want to, but you feel like you have to, right? It's just all, it's just all an invitation to, to love ourselves where we're at. A hundred percent. So what would you say to a woman who's listening right now, who's navigating the courage to possibly step into a space like this? What would you say? Mm -hmm. First of all, I would say, sister, thank you for your courage because yeah, this is hard. Stepping into uh, claiming your spot in the sisterhood is scary sometimes. And it makes so much sense for you to feel like you need courage because the wounds within the sisterhood, the ways that women have hurt each other over the past thousands and thousands of years um, and then within your own lifetime, it makes a lot of sense for this to be a little, maybe scary, maybe full out scary, maybe just a little uncomfortable, but maybe fully scary. And so I really want to honor and validate that that's for a reason, that you have reasons to feel that way. And um, secondly, I would celebrate that you are also one of the women here on the planet to change that, to change that for the rest of time. I think the desires in our hearts are signposts toward, you know, what we are meant to do in this lifetime. And if you are feeling called to being in sisterhood, even if you're terrified, then we need you. We need you here. And we need you for all of the reasons that you might be afraid that you don't belong. That's why we need you. And uh, within the sisterhood, we all belong. Mm -hmm. Full I stop. Love that. I want to, you know, just acknowledge that, that this is vulnerable space and mm -hmm. that some of the fears that come up are past experiences of abandonment, rejection, competition, um, envy, jealousy, like, and as a mother of two girls, I, I see it like very, very mm -hmm. young age. And I've been a, a part of it myself, my core wound until now. I'm very mindful of my words has always been around rejection. And so mm -hmm. I just want to give space to acknowledge that 
this that that this might be very present for some of those who are listening and i also want to invite the listeners to notice the ways in which they've created survivor strategies to avoid th- this invitation and so I'm curious from your perspective, what have you witnessed is some of the ways that for the woman who's listening right now, she may not be ready to fully receive this, right? Because it's all about receiving. And even when I think of manifestation, I think of manifestation as just allowing. Not that it's just mm-hmm. allowing, allowing what is already there and true I'm, I just wrote a course on prosperity consciousness. And one of the fundamentals of prosperity consciousness is like, as women, we are creators of life. We are naturally the tree of life. We are naturally abundant. And as long as the energy continues to flow through us, we receive it, we can give it, but we create the blocks. That's the human experience. Mm. And we get to navigate those. What are some of the things that we have done as women to show up to kind of protect ourselves from the willingness and the courage of stepping into a vulnerable space like this. Mm. I mean, I can speak even to just my own personal journey. Like I have so many beautiful sisters in my life. I feel so, so blessed and grateful um, for that because number one, it's just amazing, but also I didn't used to have it. Um, you know, I had a vision board of even just a few years ago. And one of the pictures was this, I got it from a magazine. It's like, these girls are like sitting on a couch and they're all kind of just like laid over each other. Um, just kind of laying there. And, um, I just wanted deep, deep connection within the sisterhood and, um, in a way that I had never seen it before. Um, but I just had this vision of like, no, I, this has to be possible because I wouldn't want it if it wasn't. Um, but it took me a while to get there to even acknowledge to myself that I wanted it because for years I had this story that women didn't like me and maybe I didn't like them either. Maybe I thought they were catty. Maybe I thought that they cared about things that were dumb. Um, but when I really connect to it, I didn't feel like I belonged with them. And so rather than putting myself in a position to find out, yes, that's right we don't like you, get away from us. I just, I backed up myself out of the situations, right? So I had mostly male friends, uh, you know, like all through college, but then that also like perpetuated this reason why women didn't want to be around me, right? Because I was always with with guys and then there was this whole like, oh, she's some slut or, you know, whatever these things are, because I was hanging out with my male friends. Um, And it just, we often create, we have a story, And then the actions that we choose subconsciously perpetuate the way that we feel about the story in general, right? Like we'll end up choosing an action that the result of that action affirms the fear thought that we have, right? So it's amazing that our subconscious does this, right? But I decided, oh, I don't belong with girls. So then I chose to not hang out with them. So then it gave my brain to like, see, no one wants to hang out with you. Um, So it's a long-winded way of saying that we can have all sorts of different stories. Like I don't fit in, um, women don't like me, women wanna steal my partner, um, women talk behind my back. And we can have all of those stories that maybe it's something that we learned because we experienced that, or maybe even just witnessing it in someone else is enough to like make us afraid. Uh, And so what I would say to women that have this story um, is number one, take your time. We're here for you when you're ready. And that maybe that's even like someone's story, right? Of I have to do it right now, or, or they'll close the door on me. I have to answer this text message right now, or my friend won't want to be my friend anymore. Like even just noticing that, like the urgency stories that we have around female friendships. Um, but I'm going to be here for you when you're ready. So there's that. Um, and whatever timing is yours, is, is going to be perfect. Uh, but secondly, like I was saying earlier, how like the sisterhood, the name of my program is like, we're making small shifts in the group of us, but I think it, we are intentionally co-creating how we want the sisterhood to function. So you get to decide how you want it to be, and then we can create it together. 
And so whether that's joining a circle or, you know, even just talking with your friends or reaching out to me, um, we get to intentionally decide how we want to show up together and we can make agreements and intentions and move forward together because we're all, we're all feeling this simultaneous desire and like maybe a little bit of fear, right? And so we can just name that and support each other, even in the courage it takes to join. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And for the listeners, you know, I think that there's just, there's so many ways that we can show up in kind of an unhealthy relationship to community with women. And some of it that I've noticed is some generational, like we're also in a time and place where um, we've adapted to very masculine structures and jobs and ways of, you know, creating what we think is work-life balance, but it's not because it's coming from a place of, um, you know, trying to do the mom family thing and the job thing, but not really fully showing up in either one Mm -hmm. is a huge imbalance in that area as well. And so if they're all just invitations to just sort of acknowledge and just witness and, and dive deeper into like, what is the need underneath? What is, so, you know, when you're having this experience of like, I don't feel like I belong or I have to really prove myself, like, what is that really about? Like what's underneath that? What is the need that wasn't met? Because if, and not making it wrong, but just acknowledging that that's just needing a little love and attention. That's all. Like, just listen, just listen in Mm -hmm. and be curious about, you know, the space that could open up for you and maybe even show you a new way. And we all have needs under the surface that we're not entirely consciously aware of needs to be safe, needs to feel worthy and loved and to fit in. And so those are just some of the ways. And so I just, I want to thank you for coming on the show and just sharing the work that you're doing and sharing, you know, some of the blind spots in spiritual growth and communities and also within sisterhood and reminding us the importance of standing in radical authenticity, because that feels really good. (laughs) And so giving us permission to do that rather than thinking that we have to show up a certain way to fit in there. We have to, and even for the listeners, Hannah just gave you permission. Like you don't have to, to be any type of person to be welcomed into the sisterhood because just by the very nature, well, that you're well, a sister, you are welcome into the sisterhood. Mm -hmm. So I love that you just give that permission. And I want to invite you to share where can people find you and what are you excited about? What are you sharing? What's coming up next? Yeah. So I am active on Instagram. My handle on Instagram is at Hannah McKenna underscore underscore, and we can share that for the show notes or whatever. Um, and I have a website, Hannah McKenna.com. Um, but yeah, on Instagram, please reach out. I mean, being in the DMS and just talking about this stuff, you know, Uh, please don't be shy because this is my highest joy is knowing people. Connection is my top value. Mm. And so uh, you can follow along with with me, uh, whether it's, you know, spiritual type quote cards in my Instagram or silly reels or me just in my stories talking about my life. Um, I'd love to connect with you there. Uh, And I have, um, I'm really excited about the sisterhood program that I'm running right now. I've been talking about it throughout this show uh, and it is a three month container that will open again uh, at the end of May. So if this is something that you're wanting, uh, please reach out or go to my website. You can sign up on the wait list there for, for the next time the doors open. And it would be amazing to have you there. If you're not quite ready to be in the group, maybe even just some one-on-one healing or you know talking about this stuff one-on-one, I do offer one-on-one coaching as well for for all genders actually but um especially if you're a woman that's thinking about maybe the sisterhood that can be a good option to just start there to start smaller and like i said honor the parts of you that might need some one-on-one attention or to 
to feel um, that container before entering into a bigger space. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. And we'll definitely put those in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining me in this conversation today. And for the listeners, we'll be sure to put her website and Instagram handle, handle so that you can reach out to her if this resonates with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. This has been great. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Have a wonderful day.